Welcome to another episode of Inside the Headset with the Palestine High School head football coach Kyle Ralph, special teams coordinator Wes Anderson, joined again today by Dragons offensive line coach Dan Buchanan. And gentlemen, we're we're talking about the 2015 semi-state game today, Castle High School. Um, second half and and um, talk about the first half yesterday. So we're going to the locker room here with a 28-6 lead. And we talked about a little bit of the episode yesterday. Um, I felt pretty good about how things were going offensively. Um, really running the ball well. Yeah, Offensive ball line ball. is really yeah. dialed in. Dialed in. Um, defensively had some struggles. So, so Coach Ralph, I'll, I'll ask you the question that, that I usually ask here at the start of the second half episodes is, is kind of how the locker room was and what happens. And, and then Coach Buchanan, I kind of want to get – from your perspective, a, a general overview of how halftime goes for you in a, in, in a general game, but also in this game specifically. So, Coach Ralph, I'll start with you. Yeah, like I said in the previous video, you guys are going to have to excuse me here. My my sinuses with our beautiful Indiana weather right now are absolutely killing me. So, uh, I apologize for that. But, um, yeah, I mean, offensively, you know, we, we had that opening drive where we, you know, we had dropped the ball and, and uh, kind of trying to figure them out a little bit and what their plan was. Uh, got stuck down there in the mud the one time. But, you know, our, our, our three drives in the middle of that, you know, it was weird because we only had five possessions here uh, in the first half. And, and uh, again, that's pretty – Pretty uncommon for us, but we were efficient. You know, we scored on three of the five. Um, you know, we're really playing pretty solid football offensively. Uh, you know, trap has been a nice change of, of pace for us. We've gotten a couple good kickouts. We've gotten a couple good logs on it, so we're going to stick with that. Um, you know, our, our passing game stuff, we haven't really had to open it up a whole lot, but verts was something we thought in this game was going to be really good for us, and it's been good for us, so – you know, really just, uh, you know, talk to the kids, see if there's anything out there that they see or feel that's maybe uh, an addition to or different than what we had had. But, uh, yeah, our main concern was just defensively. I just felt like we weren't playing with a lot of a lot of pop and, and a lot of intensity, especially there on that last drive. So, we really addressed that a lot uh, pretty heavily. Pretty heavily. Uh, there wasn't a lot to do with a lot to do offensively. No real adjustments, honestly. What we've been doing has been working really well. Um, so there's there's really in this particular game not a ton to do outside of just you know when you're not making adjustments, you're more so just going there and just reaffirming things with the kids, making sure we're all on the same page before we go back out. But uh, defensively, again, it wasn't a schematic thing or like, hey, we need to make an adjustment to this particular play. It was more of you know. Gentlemen, this is the standard of what it means to play defense here, and you're not living up to it right now, and and uh, that's unacceptable, and and uh, that's going to change. So, we play a pretty good second half here, and kind of get this one uh, a little bit out of hand. But you know, you, you wouldn't think a team that was quote unquote of this caliber uh, at a semi-state level is going to need a little bit of kick in the pants, but at the end of the day, they're high school kids and, and it was a Saturday game and it kind of breaks us out of our routine. And I think uh, one side of the football was a little bit of sleep at the wheel here and uh, uh, they need to be reminded of what's at stake. So uh, overall, good halftime though, you know, but we, we just have to have one of those moments that, that sometimes you have to have. So Coach Buchanan, to you now, I know you you probably felt pretty good about how your guys played during that first half. So talk a little bit about the half and the halftime. But then I also want you to, to kind of share with everybody a little bit about kind of your halftime routine. And, and, you know, obviously you guys are the engine that makes us go. I mean, you know, we run for all those thousands of yards every year, and we can't do that without our offensive line. So um, I think any insight you can you can provide to that would be really, really good. Well, I mean, <clears throat> on this particular game, um, going into the locker room, yes, I was pleased with the way we played. I was not very happy about the last drive. Um, these guys were, were really talented and experienced, but they were also had the, uh, the weakness of 
becoming complacent when they felt like they were they already in their mind that you know the game was over and that's I kind of felt that way on that last drive because I didn't think we you know like like Kyle said we were in the Bermuda Triangle but you know we we went three and out punted the ball back to them and, and allowed them to score because I just didn't feel like our head was completely in the game so that that was where the start was I mean right after I warmed my feet up but uh, you know. <laughs> And, you know, and just got them fired up to go back out in the second half and continue doing what they've been doing earlier in the, in the first half. And I think they did a pretty good job of doing that. As far as game by game, I mean, norm, a normal game, a lot of it depends on how much adjusting we're going to do. What, what do we have to do to adjust? I usually go in the coach's office and meet with Kyle and, and the rest of the coaches, and we kind of figure out what those adjustments are. And then I go in the, you know, I go in the locker room gather my guys up and usually usually the whole offense uh, because it usually affects everyone. And then if we're going to change a play or change the way we're blocking something or, you know, once in a while we'll add something that maybe we did the week before, uh, not that often, but sometimes. And I would, I would put that in and show them, show them how we're doing that. And, you know, just make sure everyone understood what we're doing, you know, to make sure the backs knew what we were doing, you know, everyone. So, and that's that's pretty well what what halftime. You know, it's about how long it takes by the time you meet with Kyle and walk over to the locker room and meet and meet with those guys and get them fired back up and get the plan in. That is a halftime, so that's my normal day. All right. Well, let's right, well let's let's, uh, let's watch some football here, boys. Some football here, boys. So like I said, twenty-eight six. Um, looks to me like the conditions have improved a little bit here. Uh, obviously, the field conditions will not, but it's not raining slash snowing sideways anymore, which is probably a positive. Yeah, like Dan said, it was cold, though. Yeah, like there's one out in the start of half, too. Yeah, there's one out in the lane one of the track. So got to feel like a stop here probably goes a long way. This formation we call ace tight in here. Basically, whip post. Yeah, they're just trying to hold your underneath coverage there with that that tight end doing that little sit down route and <clears throat> we got too many people dropping into the wrong spots here and in the wrong zones and we open up that dig behind us but again they're they're just a hair off all night uh which helped a lot we've talked about formations a little bit and the variety of things that they do here's the first time that we've seen this We've seen it the other way with the twins over here. Um, this would be a formation we call Laredo. Two tights, twins, but this is the first time we've seen it to the left, and you're going to get you're going to get Buck sweep here. Great play by Joe. Great play by Joe. Great play by Joe. Great play position on this one. Really nice job of getting those pullers in the puller pocket there, and then chasing it there, and then chasing it. I think our D-line and our linebackers play really, really, really well in this game. And they really don't run the ball very well at all. The bad track helps us again a little bit on this one here. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not getting any pressure from our guys up front either, which you – know, their offensive line was pretty good size and, and pretty – you know, pretty, pretty, pretty good, really. Um, and and we're only going to bring three here, but we're we're just flat out not getting any pressure at all, and we we lose our underneath coverage again here to a degree. They're just kind of standing around there, too close to the line of scrimmage. I 
get them to punt. And again, like we talked about, you know, this is probably getting into the situation, bad weather, wet balls, that we're just not going to touch these. Well, you can see how far back Nick was on that play. They had the wind at their back here. And this punter really had – I mean, he had just absolutely blasted a few of them. Um, you know, we wanted a few of them. He kicks this ball 15 yards short. I mean, this this was not what we had expected. Uh, probably not a game if it still rained that we would have come and caught that punt anyway, to be honest. But uh, that that was not expected. There's just a muddy football. It almost slides right through Alex's hands here. I kind of lose your match. Yeah. I mean, you can tell just looking at our guys. Just looking at our guys. Because the field, the field itself, the field, the look, field at it, itself. Look, look at it, look at it, muddy. Well, you look at our guys' uniforms, they're just caked with mud. I mean, it, it was a, it was a bizarre. I mean, look at Joe's uniform. It was it was, it was in really, 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 really bad shape. Really nice. Back really zone here. Quarterback outside zone. <clears throat> We're gonna. I mean, though, we've already watched the Snyder game, but we literally run the exact same play against Snyder for a huge touchdown. We actually run it multiple times here. But good job up front. Good seals from the offensive line. Good kick out by Joe. Good seal block by Nick as well. It's uh, a really nice play. Yeah, Nick actually does a really nice job. That's the backside linebacker. Scraping all the way over. We, get, we still got linemen that are slipping and falling and stuff. It's, it's, it's pretty bad out there on the field. I mean, there's not much traction. Gonna be a flood. We saw this one earlier. Yep. This is the first play of the game. Good read here by Alex. Good routes as well. We get this guy kind of high load in between the two of them and <clears throat> dump the ball over the top here to uh, Duke. Reading that kid. We've talked about our flood concept a little bit in some of these other episodes here. This kid kind of gets caught in no man's land a little bit here. A little bit. Yeah, he tries to split it, but the round, right. rounds are, are pretty well executed. So Alex makes a nice throw. So he really, he really can't. Quarterback inside zone. Yeah, not a great, not a great job by Nick on this one. Actually, as he comes across, he's the blocker. He's got to, he's got to be tighter to this defensive end and actually hit him with his right shoulder. This guy squeezes really hard, but that running back's got to be a lot tighter. Play. Now he ends up, he ends up finishing the block and doing a nice job, but we really want that guy to be tighter than that and and try to get inside on that guy, but. He ends up kind of logging them almost, essentially, and uh, Alex reads it fairly well and jump cuts out behind him. I'll tell you what, Coach Buchanan, really good job here by your, your freshman right tackle. End up yeah, on a knockdown. I actually meant to look that up this morning, see how many knockdowns we had in that game. I forgot about it, but yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Comes trap again. Yeah, we just don't quite get that guy over number three on this one. Well, very few times, like I said, they're they're not a big a big. Uh, Man-to-man -man team, but we've run the ball so well here. They uh, they bring these guys down a little bit tighter. <clears throat> Just give us a little bit of a a little bit of a different look. But. 
you're going to play a whole lot of man to man like that or any kind of cover one or that really deep cover three like they are this quarterback run is 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 pretty much like stealing Boy, that thing is is just two miles wide. I mean, it basically ends up here because Keel Keel basically sends this dude into the hot dog stand. I mean, that's what you want. Yeah. We'll get the Mike linebacker for a change. I mean, we we struggled with that guy the whole night. It looks like we're on this time. Definitely a nice start. Let's go make it 30, 35-6. Well, one's a coincidence, two's a pattern, three's a streak. Um, yeah, you can tell it's still really windy out. I mean, we're still having to hold the ball on the tee and everything. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, for Spencer to keep the ball out of bounds twice is concerning because he's way too good for that. I mean, he's way too good for that. Outside zone, you know, they kind of run this almost like a mid zone, really. Occasionally. I think this is outside, though, looks like. Really a much better job by our guys up front here, actually holding their ground. There's White Pop. White Pop. <clears throat> Pretty good job here by Pretty Luke. Job here by Luke as a freshman of carrying the vertical here. At least, at least staying underneath us. They can't just throw it in there. So, not bad. Not bad. We've, we've, got, we've got again two linebackers though within a yard of each other. We're we're not. We're just not playing clean football. So let me ask you about this change here. Yeah. Because that's Nick and that's Brett. And that, you know, we've not seen this look in the, the 2015 games that we've done so far. So let me ask you about that. So Nick was just a great player uh, overall. I mean, he really did so many things for us. I know we we watch that state championship game where he gets hurt and we lose him, but when we played against certain packages, um, Nick Nick actually played linebacker, and he only weighed about 185 or 90 pounds, something like that, about 185 pounds. Um, but normally he was the adjuster. Um, but when we would play like our monster package or if we played a team that was, uh, you know, really solid at running the football – he could come up and play linebacker as needed. The The difference in this game, <clears throat> with the size of their tight ends, we just didn't really have a lot of options, to be honest. Um, Height-wise, we were at such a significant disadvantage. And size-wise, if you had height, our personnel put us at a significant disadvantage. So we looked at the game plan for the week, no, they've got those two. Well, got those two we don't really have anybody to to be able to deal with that. You know, like the two, and it's and this is kind of one of those things from year to year that you've got to really figure out how you're going to put the pieces of the puzzle together, and then you you've got to understand that that puzzle is going to be put together differently every year because the pieces are all shaped differently. So, like the 2014 team. If they would have played Castle, we would have been perfectly fine. We would have been able to play, you know, probably Noah in a linebacker-type position or something like that. And we had a lot of personnel that were big that could run. In 15, we didn't. We we had a lot smaller kids, uh, didn't have as much height and as much length. So – uh, and some of the kids that maybe were longer were like like Gunner at the bottom of the screen. He's over six foot, but he weighs – he's a sophomore in this film. He weighs like 
140 pounds. So when we looked at it, the, the best way to stop their tight end so that they could not just lob these wide pops up against us was to put the bigger kids that we had at Dragon and Buck and then essentially put Brett in center field where there wasn't going to be like a ton, ton of action and then put the best players that we could essentially up front. Uh, and so Crumlin is going to move out and play Dragon. Adam is going to stay over there and play Buck. But, it, you know, James was at least like 6'1 and, and like 185 or 90 pounds. I mean, that was the best that we had that could play winning championship level football. Uh, to, to be able to deal with the big you know, at least not at least not I mean, the one kid was like six five. We don't. Again, the 2019 team would have been great because you've got, you know, Cade was six three and Maxim was was almost six two. That wouldn't have been as big of a problem. But, you know, our our alley players this year were were either going to be about. 60 to 70 pounds too light or four to five inches too short to get this job done. So we just had to piece together <laughs> uh, whatever we thought was going to be best here. And, and again, thankfully we've done this a lot. Uh, thankfully Nick was such a tremendous player that we could put him almost anywhere on the field and he would be all state caliber there. So he played linebacker this game for us, um, more so to get him close to the box to play against their running game stuff um, and and make our personnel fit better because we really, again, truthfully, we were really thin this year. Um, we just didn't have a, a third linebacker that we thought could play, you know, real winning championship football, which is partly why Luke Ely as a freshman is on the field right now because he could. But he beat everybody else out as a freshman. So if we have to move Crumlin, another linebacker has to come in. The next best player to do that is to is Nick to slide Nick up. So that's where he's at. The hard part about that, which isn't hard for our kids, our kids do a great job at it, but one of the harder parts about that then is you've got to you've got to make the kids believe and understand that this is what's going to be best and what's going to work. And they've got to have confidence in that. So, uh, so yeah. But like you can see here, well, you can see the here though, though, they change roles. So role. it comes back out and Crumlin goes back in. Crumlin goes back in. Cause we didn't, we didn't want James out in space. So when they went into their heavy packages, James was going to play dragon or bug. And Nick is going to play. Uh, linebacker, uh, when linebacker. They go the spread formation, those two swaps. That also has to go into your your weekly plan and, and how you're going to do this stuff. We've got one right in our hands here. Gunner's got one right in his hands. We drop it. Kind of their vertical package again. Yep. The hard part about this too, like Nick should carry this vertical from number two but he's also out of position because that's what – we were just so thin this year. You know, that, that's just – it's just what had to be done. We were just so thin. Well, that's not going well. No, nope, you're in the Bermuda Triangle here, boys. <clears throat> almost – tough to see, but you almost had the old double kick here. Yeah, he so – he, he, uh, he slips – he slips and falls on this essentially, but the ball's not in his hands, so it's not down. Then he picks it back up, and we, we get to him. I mean, it's uh, – the film does not do it justice, like Dan said, how cold it was and how windy this game was and how wet this game was. You really can't tell from the film, but in all seriousness, this game was – it was a miserable weather atmosphere. Um, so some of these special teams, you know, kind of – It's an adventure. Snafus and stuff here, it is it's, – it is, it is definitely an adventure. So it looks like he does kick this, right? At least partially. He slips. He like yeah. slips and falls as he kicks it or something. It like hits him. 
So just so our folks are aware, so folks when, are when, aware. You're, when, when you when you kick this when, and it doesn't go past the line of scrimmage, you can actually pick it up and kick it again. Yeah, he like drops the ball as he goes to kick it. He slips. Well, that's well, that's that's really crippling for them down thirty-five-six, and you're going to give us a ball in the sixteen-yard line. And then there's a Verts immediately for a touchdown. You know, we talked about this a little bit um, <clears throat> in this. So this is really the response to what they had done the last time we were down here on the goal line. They they played like a cover one look, and then they played a zero look. I was just going to assume that out of the gate here, they were probably going to come back to that zero look, and we, we catch them in a bare zero here. And they're, they're guys, again, they just don't do this. Uh, Joe does a really good job here of acting like he's going to run block and stuttering for a second, and then he just takes off on this guy. But their their guys just hadn't done this stuff on a regular basis. So, you know, technically, is it easy to <laughs> is it easy to cover somebody in man to man? I guess it is, but it's also not. And and especially when you don't do it very often, uh, you know, it, it can. Here we are having to hold the ball again. Thankfully, this one stays in bounds. But yeah, that's why we went. Uh, I normally am not – I am not at all one of those like, hey, there's a sudden change of possession, let's take a shot here type guys. But um, that wasn't really a take a shot play. That was that was based on the information we had gathered from the previous series. You'll notice, too, if you look at this play, we're also running one of our bracket coverages here to stop those really fast receivers because they're at the point now where they're going to have to start artificially creating some big plays at, at 42 to 6. So – We've done this once earlier in the game, and I forgot to mention it, but this was also one of the more difficult parts of the package this week is we're going to sacrifice numbers by the box to make sure that they can't hit these big-time one-on-one routes with these two really fast kids on the outside. This is kind of that wide choice route here. He just judges, he just judges where you're – where your backers play, and then he makes his break either way. It, I mean, they've got good timing. Quarterbacks triggering the ball already. These guys were good. I, again, I think we caught them on a little bit of a tough night, but uh, just a really nice little route here. Yeah, this is one. <clears throat> Actually, kind of just saw this this clip show up on my Twitter feed the other day from the uh, one of those John Green quarterback camp things that he used to do a few years ago and it was with Andrew Luck and he was actually talking about this exact route right here where you know it's really just it's really just an option you know he can do one of about four things based on how you leverage him and when you've got a big body like that that makes it really really helpful um it's one of those it's a really good play I mean it takes a long time to get really good at it you know you've got to practice a, a ton but you know, when you've got a kid like that, that's a really, really, that's a really good, really good play to have in the arsenal. Buck sweep again. Really nice job here by Luke Ely and these guys, <laughs> the guys uh, on the right hand side. Right -hand side of... We have really done a nice job on the buck sweep in this game. Yep. Really, really have. It's not something that we see a lot, honestly. I mean, we've seen it a little more frequently in the last couple of years. I mean, Decatur runs it. Um, Cathedral ran it some. Delta runs it a lot. Yeah, we have been good against it from the shotgun especially. Third and I'll call it third and medium. There's the there's the choice again. Yeah, they hit this dig here again. It's been a nice route for them. They keep running underneath cover actually. down here. We get 
couple linebackers that are standing on top of each other again, which is never what you want, especially into the boundary. There's no reason for it over there. But <clears throat> they hit this dig right in the middle of the field again. They're one of the very few teams that we have ever played that really came after the middle of the field like this. And our linebacker drops are, are not good right now, and it, it's hurting us. <clears throat> Pretty Bruce common. Some of that's designed, too, because we, we normally we don't – we don't protect the middle of the field as much normally because a lot of teams just flat mm -hmm. out don't throw it there. Pretty common two-by-two, two, kind of a run and shoot, a little bit of air raid type concept here, this dig whip. Dig whip, look at a two-by-two. Two. Actually whip up here, arrow down here. But um, pretty common to see that from some of those some of those, you know, run and shoot offense type teams. Back to the split flow outside here. Flow outside here. This running back here was a pretty solid player. The he's the backup. I think we had knocked the starter out of the game in the first half. This Same kid was play. this kid was a pretty good, tough little runner. He, he was thick. He, 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 he was so he got get his legs. The other kid was just fast. This kid was kind of thick, and and really we had worked on getting his legs choked down. He was he was pretty solid running back. Yeah, they're putting a little drive together here, but the positive is that it's taking them a lot of time to do this, <clears throat> and obviously time will be the determining factor here in a what is it forty two six right now? Yeah. They're also doing this. They're getting really risky and going for a lot of these deeper throws here now, or they're, go they're going to, rather. And this is where they had hurt a lot of people the whole year on these stutter and goes, the slant and goes, the hitches and goes. They had really hurt a lot of people. And <clears throat> after some talking with the defensive backs, we were it was nice to see us uh, over the top of that one. We do a good job again on this one here of being over and under it. <laughs> Really nice job there by Jordan Workman. Should have gotten a penalty on that for us being held, but we do not. Great job here by him, though, crossing the center's face and, and really just getting after this kid. A really nice job by him. He was so fast off the ball. Yeah, we almost we, – we kind of over-pursued that then with everybody else. Well, Doug is going to need a timeout here. going to need a timeout here. <clears throat> so, come out, show your pro, show your eye formation here. Call timeout and then go back into spread. <clears throat> this is where they've been running some of their <clears> – some of their – sweep stuff from they really haven't shown a lot of passes here and then they kind of do a a little bit of a wide delay at the bottom and up at the top here they they really just kind of they just run like a little i'm not even sure it's it's like a kind of a hitch pick like route weird weird thing here it almost looks like it's supposed to be like a slot fade but we we press into this guy so much, they just kind of sit down. I think he was just trying to occupy us, honestly. It's not a rubber out there. There's another Y pop that we break this one up. It's a good job. I think that's. It's Joe, isn't it? The reroute. Yeah. Um, Pretty good job here, really, overall. <clears throat> that might be Logan that breaks that ball up, too, then. I can't quite tell. I think yeah, it's it is. Yeah. But that's, that's a good job, though, reaching through the hand. That kid's big 6'3", and Logan's 5'7", so that's pretty, pretty good job, technically, of, of getting your hand through there on that play. Another good job of the guys up front here. 
split zone again. For those of you that may not have watched the entire series, when I talk about split zone, everybody's blocking left here. And then this wing on the left is going to come all the way back across. And there's a couple things that they do here. He may, he may block him, but a lot of times they'll actually just run him right by. And they're trying to set up some of their boot stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we play a couple teams that do this. We do it ourselves. So, mm -hmm. good play. <clears throat> Yeah, we ran it some. Um, if you were at the Franklin game this year, Franklin Community, they it's their base run play. They do it a ton. They do it a ton. Really good play if you've got really good wings that can block. And, and we were really lucky the last couple of years to have some guys that did. This is one of the toughest things. Yeah, it's like a little slice play. Yep. <clears throat> we see a lot of these air raid teams that run this play. It's hard to stop. It's, it's really difficult to deal with here. Yeah, uh, Newcastle does this to us a ton. Zionsville loves it. Just short underneath here. Newcastle used to run this a ton to the Bumbleo kid. Try to catch this in here and get vertical. I mean, we passed the thing off pretty well. It's just a really, you know, it's just a really easy pitch and catch. And uh, it's just a good route. It's hard to stop, especially when we blitz like that and we don't have any underneath coverage over there. And then a really nice play here on fourth and fourth and short. Yeah, Joe does a good job on this play. He almost picks this ball off, but – we're going to bring pressure uh, from Luke here in the field side, and then go to the open up to the man side and get that tight end up on that. Quarterback trap. Quarterback trap. Yeah, it's a good adjustment here, but the guys up here, the guys up here, we end up having to collect the guys who would normally trap. And then we actually collect the spiking uh, five technique as well, and the guard passes by both of them, which is what he's supposed to do. And he ends up actually kicking out the linebacker. Really ends up being a great play and a great job by those guys. They both collect the two spike players, and then we end up kicking out the linebacker. Uh, they're obviously guessing the ball's going to our left, and it's not. It's going to go to our right with the quarterback concept here. Again, this is kind of one of those things, the play caller, that you've got to take advantage of. You can see we're running the quarterback a lot more here because that double spike gap or place is, is not easy to deal with when you're looking to possibly pull the ball. So we're just going to run it right into that pressure, and it's going to give them a lot more trouble than, than they would have anticipated. That was a good job of the guys up front, though. Is this the inverted rear here? Yeah, this is the play that we actually don't run very often. We haven't run it for a couple of years. Uh, this actually is our inverted veer. We're going to all zone to the to the right, and the quarterback and the running back are going to run a flat course inverted veer to the left. We don't do this very often. Um, you know, it, it's something we do with with our power read, but again, we're trying to. Attack, you can see that defensive end he gets so far out of place. We missed the front side linebacker here, which hurts, but this also is a really hard play to do. Uh, Nick, Nick makes Nick, it. Nick makes it. Back to quarterback zone. Yep. And go to the fourth now. You can There's see that spike again. The issues when they've got that. But now they've got seven in the box, essentially, here, really. So now when they double spike, there's two off the backside. What we really should do here is probably just throw this little RPO bubble that we've got built in, but we don't we don't fling it out there. We should, but we don't. Uh, that's kind of the ups and downs of that when you don't, ex you know, when you expect something out of a team. And now here we are, obviously, they're not. 
they're not doing what we thought they were going to do, um, you know, it, it can really change that picture for your quarterback. So, <clears throat> with them playing – with them playing what looks like more man-to-man type stuff here again or, or, or cover one, uh, these routes now like this one, which is out, which are hard-breaking routes from the two slot receivers, these are good calls against your man-to-man or cover one because it's harder for those guys, especially a little bit of a slick track to, to stay on these guys in, uh, in that. But they end up playing cover three here, so it's still a good call against cover three, but – more so calling this if they're going to stay in, like, their man-to-man or cover one type stuff, but they don't. But it's a good call for both. Now they're back into it again, though. Here's their cover zero stuff. Once again, if you're going to play zero and load the box, we don't have numbers in our favor, so we've got to get them back in our favor somehow. Using a running quarterback against teams that are going to play zero, or in this case, bear zero again, um, puts the numbers back in your favor. So the linemen are going to go three for three. Three for three. And then Nick's going to pick that front side backer up. Pretty good job again, really, by the guys up front and by Nick. That's a pretty good job. Pretty good job. Hat for a hat. Hat for a hat. That's what you want. That's what you want. Boy, Yazel just, just strong arms. Just strong arms. Just dude. That's – you're, you're you going like, over there. Can probably talk some about this as well, but normally we identify the mic here. When we get this bear, there's there really can't be a uh, a call for the mic linebacker because our combination can't get him. So we've got this built in because then Nick Nick takes over the mic linebacker for us. So we we've really just got to go uh, four for four up front, that backside combo, if they can, has got to try to get the backside linebacker and then Nick takes the, the mic there. So I'm not sure if sometimes they I, I identify this and don't call them or just call fan here. Um, but it, it looks like, I don't know, Coach, Coach McCain, you can probably speak to it some, but they've, they've got the right call on here. Uh, they're doing a great job. But this one probably I mean, one of those rare scenarios where we don't call the mic out and they're, they're going to have to call fan. Well, I mean, I think they probably called the mic, but you, they're not going to get him. I mean, right. the, the first linebacker there is the mic, but you got four straight covered linemen. I mean, the backside tackle would have to block him, so you're right. It's 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 nearly impossible to get to him. That's I mean, that's that's why you run this quarterback lead zone, so you can add a hat. You know, that creates, like you said, a lot of a lot of math problems for them defensively. <laughs> Matt Mullen makes a nice, nice block there, too. Yeah, he did, yeah. Double tight, double tight, inside, inside. We just get a, just a good push from the guys on the left here. We get, you know, Yazel's got a nice block. David's got a great block. Nick gets a solid block over here to the left. And, and the, the linebackers, who meets Nick in the whole one-on-one, and, and Nick does a good job of – actually, we do this drill in practice, some of exploding up over the pile here and, and getting somewhat airborne to change your launch angle a little bit, your contact angle. So really, at this point, I mean, obviously, it's it's over, over. Um, you know, we want to finish the ball game up clean here and <clears throat> get ready to move on. There's a freshman CJ Fabian out there running down on kickoff as well. Colby's out there as a freshman. Luke's out there as a freshman. Then we've got Gunner on there as a sophomore. Brett's out there as a sophomore. Like I said, it was it was it was thin. It was a thin group. We were playing a lot of young kids. I know we talked about that against Snyder, but we were playing a as good as this senior class was. Um, man, we we were playing a lot of young players.
rear quarterback roll from them there. Yeah, you know, that was one of the things that we had evaled. He had he had almost never run the ball. Almost never run the ball. They, they read almost nothing. It was pretty much – it looked like a read, but it was pretty much always a give. Uh, he had almost never carried the football. Now, he actually could move pretty well, but, yeah, that was not something they were really comfortable with. Well, I'll tell you what, well, I'll, I'll be honest. As soon as this ball came out of his hand, I thought, well, that's going to be intercepted. I also didn't even see the tight end coming across, but just the, just this trajectory right here, I'm going, this ball's, this ball's going to belong to us. He's throwing that ball right to, right to Brett. Yeah, he sails this one a little bit right over this tight end. We need to get a better jam with that tight end there. Good job by Brett being in the right spot, though. So Nick's out at running back. Adam's back in. Is that just a scoring time thing? Yeah, we're just going to let them finish this stuff up. Really good movement, Alex. Alex. What, what's that? It's a really good movement there. Yeah, this is the one where we're getting like four, you know, four yards of push. A whistle there. You know, we've just been able to throw the ball so little here. I know you're, you know, hey, you're up by 40-something points, but, like, at the end of the day, we're going to need to throw the ball. We're going to need to throw the ball. We're going to need to throw the ball. You know, being outside like this, outside like this, you can throw the ball, period. But we've at least got to get a pass or so in here and keep keep our passing game at least going in the right direction. Because, you know, we're going to need it going down to the dome. You can throw the ball much easier than uh, – when it's when it's 21 degrees and muddy and windy, you can throw it a lot better in the dome when it's uh, 72 and sunny with no wind whatsoever. So we need to at least put the ball in the air a couple times, maybe just to stay a little bit sh sharp on it. In my opinion, Joe plays just an incredible game here <clears throat> on both sides. He really has a nice night. It's a good route. Well, I Tough catch. The Snyder game, Joe never got enough credit for how good of a route runner he actually was. He was mm -hmm. he was a really smart route runner and really knew how to use his body and his strength to his advantage. He was, uh, he was a really talented receiver on top of being our, our all-state Mike linebacker. You know, at this point, and, and we talk a little bit about, can't see the play clock here, but, you know, one of the things that you always talk about in your in your clinic thing is, you know, we, we're, you know, we're such a tempo team and we always want to go fast. And, and I think one of the questions, we've talked about this a little bit, but one of the questions that, that I think you get most frequently is, well, well, what do you want to do when you slow down? You know, how do you, how do you, communicate to your kids when you want to slow down and you know, there's 820 something here and then we snap this ball with this ball seven with you know 740 something yeah 755 55 and why don't you talk and a little bit about that you because about you know that? I mean it, it really is pretty simple what we do I mean you, just, you, you don't give the kids a play there's nothing they can do yeah, it's not hard to adjust. Yeah, it's hard to adjust. If you want to run a play, you give them a play. If you want them to slow down, you don't give them a play. They, they can't line up and run their own play on their own. You know, they 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 need some direction. So if you want to slow down, you just don't give them a play. Uh, it's it's really not that hard. I know a lot of people have kind of freaked out at times about it. Like, oh God, you know, you're up tempo. What if you want to slow down? Well, then you you slow down. You just you just don't call the plays as rapidly. Uh, if, if they don't get a play, they can't run a play. So, um, you know, we've got a couple things that we do, and usually, honestly, we'll just put our hands up and tell them just hold on. 
They also know the game scenarios, though, and we'll tell them in the huddle, like, hey, fellas, you know, there's no rush here. We're going to play, play pretty slow, pretty conservatively here, so just take your time getting up to the ball and just be ready to go whenever it's necessary. But, yeah, I mean, if you don't want to, if you don't want to play to be run, don't call a play in. It's, it's, not, it's not that hard. That was another trap, though. It was good log. I think that was uh, another trap there, good log by – by Matt again, I believe we. This guy comes down here real tight, and Matt does a nice job logging him right there and bounce that trap outside a little bit, and get a good run out of it. It's a nice job. It's a good example, I and mean, I, I circled the clock here at seven fifty because you know we've taken twenty five seconds of game clock off here. Well, this Are also, we the, way was when the 25-second clock was still in. That was going to be my next question. I didn't think we were in the 40-second clock yet next, here. Yeah, next year, the 40-second clock comes out. So, what you're looking at there, obviously, was a, a first down, first down, stop the clock, stop the clock. And then when they, when they put it down, they would blow the whistle and then start the live clock again. Um, so, we, we literally milked – Essentially every second off of the clock that we could there. Yeah, that that was before the – this is the year before the 40-second clock went into play in Indiana. Pretty good looking so, inside zone here, really. Yeah, kind of a rare front side bounce there. Yeah, with those double spikes, that has to happen sometimes. Actually hits in the in the front side C gap. There, we end up getting a lot of combos on this one, which is nice because the way they play this particular play, we end up getting. Uh, actually, we end up getting three three double team blocks on this one. Really, the backside one ends up breaking off because of a blitz. But um, boy, that's really what you're looking for. Is the ability to get as many double teams as you can based on their alignment. We got a bunch at the point of attack there, which is really good. Yeah, really, really four on – starts as four on two here. Yeah, James has to break off because of the spike and, and all that stuff, and Austin does a good job collecting it, but that's just a big pile of bodies in there uh, just getting double teamed like crazy. So, 56-6, that's the final, right? Yep. Well, do we need to go the last five minutes and change here for the uh, – We start subbing some guys in and whatnot. We can, we can wrap this one up. Really. This one up. Really. Let's put all the JV guys and stuff in here and, and, uh, and pretty much wrap it up. It was pretty so toxic. All all. Yeah. It really went by quick. Too. We, we slowed the game down to get out of there. That was kind of the plan at the start of it was slow the pace of the game down. Let's make sure we get out of there healthy, burn as much clock as we can between plays. We scored rapidly, and we 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 went uh, uh, four for four there that half on offensive drives, which was really good to see, and ate a lot of clock up. And that was that was it. And here's here's an, an, an interesting thought I just had, you know, in thinking about the the four semi-states that you've played and, you know, the, the various, the various places we've been in the bracket, um, you know, 14, you're in the South, you play East, um, 15, we move up, you play Castle in the South, 18, go North, um, and play Michigan City, and then 19, um, north again, or no, south, south in 19, and, and we'll play Bloomington South in the semi-state. So I, I guess my question is, is there a difference? I, I won't ask you if there's a preference, because I, I know you're probably not going to answer that question, but, you know, is there, is there a difference in that path as, as you've gone on that, that you see, I mean, I feel like there's always like that, 
there's always the one major hurdle to get over in the playoff, regardless of, of where you play. And, you know, in 18, we had two, Zionsville and Michigan City. In 19, obviously, Whiteland was really good. Cathedral was the major challenge. So let me kind of ask you about the varying, the varying paths at through through the playoffs based on, you know, we've been in the north for a couple of years now, but the 4A path through the south, the 5A path through the south, the 5A path through the north. Dan, you want to answer that one first? <laughs> I knew the answer. I would answer it. Um, and none of it's an easy path. I mean, I, I don't, you know, some of the games, we, including this one, we won um, by quite a spread. But, you know, the, the preparation and getting, and getting ready for it and, uh, you know, the anxiety leading up to it, I don't think it made a difference where we were at or who we were playing. So I guess I don't really have an answer for that. All right, I'm back. I had to blow my nose there. Um, no, uh, you know, you know, at 13-2, we, we had to go down then through Columbus East. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly interesting. And each year has been so different. And like you said, at, at the end of the day, I, I don't really know how much it matters in the end because – inevitably you're going to have to play somebody really good at some point. Um, a lot of it just depends on how the year gets stacked up. Um, you know, I, I think 2013, we were the new kid on the block, so to speak, and, and really caught fire. We ended up uh, having to play a really good Fortville team again in the sectional championship game that, that I thought what, they had just come off a sectional championship themselves in 2012. Um, they had a really good team in 13, so we had to play them twice, and and that was hard because beating somebody twice in a season is never easy to do. Easy to do, and uh, you know, Coach Armstrong does such a great job great wherever he goes. But he had a really good team that year again, and we beat him in the regular season. And then you got to turn around and play him again in the sectional championship game, and so playing a team twice like that's really difficult. The reward for that then was we had to go play Chatard. And really what, what happened in 13 was the top, the top three teams in Indiana and in 4A were all in the southern half of the bracket. And it was us, Chittard, and Columbus East. Now, I don't think anybody was touching Columbus East that year. They ended up struggling a little bit in the championship game with, with Dwanger to a degree. But uh, – the southern half of the bracket that year just was loaded. And we were – like I said, we weren't even expected to be in that discussion. Uh, so that that was definitely hard. And, and you know, you, you got over the, the hurdle of Shatar, and then you're greeted with the juggernaut that was Columbus East, which was not great. Uh, 14 then, it was a little bit of a collision course between, I think, the two of us in the south where a lot of people just expected that us and east were going to pretty much – collide again in the semi-state game and it was it was just a matter of you know how are you going to get there you know how healthy is your team going to be when it comes time to play that game essentially because we were both so good that particular year um 15 then like I said was a whole different set of challenges because we had no uh, real commonality with anybody that we played. And that's really difficult for us, in my opinion, as far as preparation. You know, when we played in 4A, you play those teams. A lot of those teams are in our conference or our conference teams play those teams as well. There's a familiarity with those schools. When you go to 5A, those schools play the schools in their conference. There's not a lot of intermingling between – uh, us and them. We've obviously ramped our schedule up quite a bit. You know, we've played Whiteland in the regular season a few times. We obviously have played Center Grove. We signed a 5A Kokomo team that had been in the state championship game. Um, you know, we're going to play Decatur Central the next couple of years. Like, we, we've worked our way to that level, in my opinion. But when you got into it initially – there were no common opponents and most of the coaches had never coached against these teams either because we just had never had to play at that level before. So that 5A run, uh, 
you know, we end up being in the same sectional as Columbus East, which was not pleasing. You're in the same sectional as Whiteland, who was really good. Um, so our sectional in 15 had the number one and number two team in the state in it. It was us and East, so we got to play them. Then you got to turn around and play Zionsville, who's ranked and plays a 6A schedule because they were the – at the time, they were the smallest school in their conference or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're playing all those 6A schools so that you have no clue what they're all about because we don't play those teams. Uh, and then you play Castle, who's coming out of Evansville and is the biggest school in 5A. You've got no clue about their common opponent. And then you go play – the reward is you get to go play Snyder, who came out of the north, and we knew nothing about anybody from the north at all except for obviously when you turn the tape on and you watch Snyder play, you're like, oh, yeah, okay, I get it now. Um, so 18 then, we get put in the north. And like I said, we know nothing about the northern schools, really. But there's, there's no contact with them, honestly, whatsoever. So <clears throat> that was a whole that different challenge. Uh, you're, you know, you're, you're playing you're – playing, uh, a regional game in Lafayette for God's sake. Uh, you know, then you play Michigan city from all the way up in the region. And, and that's your, that's your semi-state game. Whereas previously we'd been playing, you know, teams from Columbus and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it, it's all hard. There's really, like Dan said, there's, there's no answer to it. I know that was a little bit of a, of a roundabout way to get to it, but you know, 19 then is, is a lot the same. Five A had changed so much. Uh, Cathedral wasn't supposed to be in there. Well, they got put back in there late in the summer then after another rule change happened. So that changes the, the makeup of it. Uh, you know, like the 18, the 2018 state championship game was us and Decatur and we're, we're 25 minutes apart from each other. Yeah. You know? Decatur is like three miles further South than we are. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we end up, yeah, they're, they're separated horizontal but yeah they they mm -hmm. were north and they're south and and the state championship game is between two teams that are separated by a you know by essentially a marathon run uh which is crazy you know and then and then 19 we obviously play valpo who's who's three hours away or whatever they are um you know but 5a had changed so much as you get into 2019 then and and all of a sudden now we're you know, we're playing Cathedral in a regional, and uh, your semi-state game then is between a lot of schools from down south that we're also not familiar with. Um, you know, you get you get Bloomington South, who we did, you know at least had a little bit of familiarity with them, but um, you know, it, it does it makes it difficult. And I think that's one of the fun challenges of the whole thing is there's never any consistency to it, and there's always that level of uncertainty where if you don't prepare and you do take somebody lightly, you're packing your bags and going home. And, and that is one of the great parts about playoff football. You know, you've got to prepare exceptionally well on a weekly basis because if you don't, or if you say, ah, you know, this team, you know, they're from Evansville and, you know, people, people say Evansville football is not as good as Indianapolis football. Well, if you buy into that stuff, you got a pretty good chance that you might go home and that team from Evansville is going to move on to the next round. So it's hard because, yeah, I mean, you, you've got to get as much information. I, like I said, I know I said this on here before, but, like, I, I pulled newspaper articles up mm -hmm. from, from their local newspapers. And I'll, I'll read newspaper articles about the games in that area and, and who's playing and what they've done and, and just to get some information on the general area. You know, I like when we played Castle, I pulled like the the Evansville Courier and I went through and read article after article after article on all those teams down there in that area um, just to try to get some kind of bearing on what we were watching and looking at. So, yeah, it, it can be really hard, but it's also really fun. I, I would say that, too. It's really fun to play new teams and um, – you know, different coaches, different styles, and and uh, I think that's a part of the joy of the game. I don't know if that, Dan, if any of that kind of sounds off with you as well, but. Well, I mean, I, 
it's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it, 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 to me, you know, I mean, obviously, like I said before, we some of the spread, we beat some teams pretty soundly, but I think that every one of those years, every one of those games was hard. So, I mean, which path is easier? I have, I can't answer that because I, we, we've been through five of them, essentially four of them in the state finals, and I don't remember any one path that seemed any easier than, than the other. They all seem pretty hard. So I guess that's my answer. I would say that 5A presents us a lot more challenges than what 4A did, especially mm-hmm. where we've gotten ourselves to at this point. But you got to remember too, you know, when we were when we were in 4A, that was also what we were working towards. That was that was our goal. So even at the time, 4A, that was a major challenge. You know, getting through those teams uh, was really difficult for us. And we've been fortunate to have some great players and and. You know, we, we've, we've had to alter, obviously, the program and the program standard, the program goals, but, you know, they, they all presented huge challenges. Yeah, it's not like it – isn't, and it isn't like 4A was much better or easier uh, just because it was 4A back then. Like I said, I mean, you had a really good Fort Bill team. You had Chittard. You had Columbus East. You had Bloomington uh, – or not Bloomington South wasn't down there yet. Um, uh, who was the other team that, that East kept – button heads with down there. So um, I can't remember who it was. Uh, but there were a lot of good teams in 4A South. And then, you know, 4A North, um, like I said, I mean, you, you had Dwanger up there. New Prairie had some great teams as well. Um, some of those other schools up there had, had a couple of really good groups. Like I, I think Leo the one year was really, really good. And, and there were a couple other teams from that area that really had had some, some great seasons from the North as well. Um, See, so, yeah, I think I think Dan's point's also a good point of like people would think, oh, you're in five A now, four A, four A would would just be easy, but but the reality of it is there's a lot of it is there's a lot of four A when we were playing four A ball. And uh and that's what we were working towards, that's what we were geared towards. So it was still really, really difficult. Um just because we've won five A twice and been there another time doesn't mean that that 4A was some pushover. It was uh, – I might remember that Beach Grove game. I mean, Dan, you remember preparing for that Beach Grove game. I was I was really nervous for that one because, God, they were they were absolutely just loaded that year. And, I mean, they were on fire. And we really ended up having our way with them. But, man, on film it was like, God, who are these guys? Like, look – I mean, this quarterback and, and the receivers they had. And it was like, oh, my God, man, where – where do these guys come from? Um, so you get those teams every year, you know, but that was, that was a difficult year as well. That was, that was a, that game was a hard game to prep for. That's a, that's, that was a really interesting discussion. I, I enjoyed that. Um, yeah, I'll say this. I, I agree with Dan that it doesn't really matter where you go where, you know, by the time you get most years, there's usually another good team in your sectional. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, but once you get beyond that, everybody you're playing is good. And it's not like, oh, well, we're in the 5A South and we've got the easiest road to ever get there. And it's, and it's, it's not like that regardless of class or regardless of what half of the bracket you're in. But um, I, I think I agree with you that some of those challenges in, in teams that you're unfamiliar with um, and they present a real challenge. I mean, we were not familiar with Cathedral. Um, I mean, when – played Cathedral, um, obviously not that not at all familiar with Valparaiso um, or Lafayette Harrison or Michigan City or, or some of those teams that we've seen in the last couple of years. So I, I think that I agree with you that that adds, 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 adds an extra level of difficulty, level of difficulty, particularly, you know, in 5A, like you said, I think it's a, you know, a lot of our 4A, our, our conference in, in 3 and 4A, you know, sees a lot of those common opponents. Well, all right, gentlemen. Well, um, we'll wrap it up here. Coach Buchanan, appreciate you being with us. Well, thanks again for having me, guys. And, um, Coach, we'll, we'll plan on getting back together next week for, uh, for another episode of Inside the Headset. So, as, as always, we'll make a call out for your questions, your comments, or anything like that that anybody might have and you want us to address, please let us know. And, and uh, Coach, we'll see you next week. Sounds good.